Good morning. We're happy to have you here today. This is the breakout session for Parkinson's and dementia. Our speaker, Daisy, is a board certified nurse practitioner, licensed to prescribe and treat in primary care and specialize in neurology and movement disorders. She has had more than 20 years experience caring for individuals with Parkinson's disease. Daisy practices at Lakeside Neurocare in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, with subclinics in Oshkosh and Griffith. She is an inpatient medical consultant to acute neurological conditions such as stroke and seizure at St. Agnes Hospital, Aurora Oshkosh, and Mercy Medical Center in Oshkosh. Daisy's clinical practice specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of individuals with Parkinson's disease. Daisy will discuss disease symptoms along with pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical treatment options for optimizing quality of life for persons living with Parkinson's disease. Please welcome Daisy. things that were going on to, uh, on to the crops and things, when what we really found was 
that it's more in the high industrial areas. Uh, uh, we did a lot of research. We did research for over 10 years in shipyard workers and railroad workers who were exposed to manganese and some of the metals, um, also um, those involved in, uh, with using solvents and paints. So Parkinson's disease uh, involves an area of the brain called the basal ganglia. Uh, and the substantia nigra. Nigra means black. You'll see in this picture that when we look at an autopsy or that area of the brain, that as you can see here in the normal brain, it's pretty black in this area right here. With Parkinson's disease on autopsy, it's blanched. That blackened area is gone. So nigra means black, substantia nigra. Um, that dopamine is lost from that area of the brain. When 70% of the dopamine is lost, that's when symptoms, motor symptoms occur with Parkinson's disease. So what do I mean by motor symptoms? Tremor, but not everybody has tremor. Only 50% of people with Parkinson's even have a tremor. To most of us, that's the primary symptom we think of. Those people with tremor tend to be the first ones who are diagnosed. Why? Because it's noticeable. Somebody's spouse says, you should probably go get that checked out, right? Or another family member. Uh, so, but tremor isn't necessarily, you don't have to have tremor to have Parkinson's disease. Rigidity or stiffness, slowness in movement, in movement, and impaired balance. In movement disorders, we kind of subclassify people into two categories. Tremor predominant Parkinson's and balance predominant Parkinson's. And why do we do that? Because it actually kind of looks different, and the course is a bit different as well. The people who are tremor predominant Parkinson's always kind of say they're the lucky ones. Um, because, yeah, it's really hard to know. The tremor is not the easiest uh, thing to treat. However, those people tend to be the ones who don't get the dementia and don't have problems with memory as much. The subgroup of people with balance predominant Parkinson's tend to have more dementia. Um, and that we know based on our lifespan database as well as our, our, our brain gain. Um, so sometimes we like to try to have a little bit of a crystal ball, um, but there are certain things that we kind of look for uh, to maybe give us warning signs of a possible dementia. Some secondary features, and it's funny that we call these secondary features, actually, because now we kind of know that some of these secondary features are actually the first features of Parkinson's disease. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the National Parkinson's Foundation website, uh, they'll tell you that uh, this problem with anosmia, so heart of loss of smell, um, and also people who have very vivid dreams at night is kind of a precursor to motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In fact, uh, when we talk about sleep disturbance, and I'll kind of get into this in more detail later, those people who do have that, what we call REM sleep disorder, or rapid eye movement sleep disorder, um, that stage in sleep where you dream a lot, but your body's paralyzed, in our patients, at times, they tend to act out their dreams. I'll have spouses that come in with black and blue eye because um, they had very active dreams. That, we now know, uh, is a precursor to a, a dementia in Parkinson's disease. So to me, if I have a patient who's coming in and things are going well, we're treating the symptoms well, but they are also having these, this uh, rapid eye movement, you know, uh, REM sleep disorder where they're having, calling out during the night, having a lot of vivid dreams, a little red flag goes up for me, and I do a few things a little different than what most people do in trying to be proactive on treating or warding off a possible dementia. I'll get into that a little bit later. So some of the other secondary features are small handwriting, a reduced arm swing on the affected side. Some people have what we call a phrasing gait, so it feels like their feet get stuck and just can't move. Um, I mentioned the sleep disturbance. Um, you can have just excessive saliva, and that's not because people with Parkinson's produce more saliva than the rest of us do. It's just that, that the amount of saliva that it takes to trigger that swallow reflex is diminished. So it's really more about the swallow reflex. Masked face. So 
feeling like uh, they, you know, you might have noticed that a person with Parkinson's just doesn't have as much facial expression, and they'll definitely have a little less facial expression on the, on the affected side. That tends to be a little bit of a problem for me if I have patients who go to the ER because it can be misdiagnosed as a stroke as well. Um, hypophonia, which is soft voice, strict posture, and constipation due to uh, bowel dysmotility or slow uh, motility in the bowel. So you can see it's pretty complex. We're not just covering movement in, in my visits. Most of the time, it's a lot of other things that we're covering uh, rather than just movement. So what do they have trouble with? Getting out of bed, rising from a chair, starting movement. Sometimes there's some hesitation with starting movement. Sometimes the feet are back here and the head is going forward and they have a hard time stopping movement. Um, some shuffling when walking. What does that lead to? More falls. So the affected side might just not move as well. Uh, they might not have as big of a step edge in their gait and could catch a lip on a sidewalk. Um, and that can cause a fall. Uh, they tend to, when they sit in a chair, uh, lean towards the more affected side. Obviously, it can diminish your capabilities of performing your activities of daily living. For some people, it, it causes problems with swallowing. That's not across the board, just like the dementia is not across the board. I always kind of say that Parkinson's is like a pot of stew. You don't know what you're going to get on your spoon. Mm -hmm. um, low blood pressure, dizziness with standing. I'll get into that a little bit more, too. Double vision. And then memory problems and problems with verbal fluency. So what do we do? So we have a dopamine loss, a neurotransmitter in the brain that's depleted. So our goal with treatment is to give back dopamine. It's actually quite simple. Uh, the gold standard treatment is a medication called carbidopa levodopa, or as one of my patients calls it, it's oompa loompa pill. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like to be able to say it either. It's a hard thing to say. So, um, with all of our Parkinson's medications, you know, and I had, I had six new patients yesterday, and you know, it's hard to tell people that when you're going to go to treat that. The minimum dosage is three times a day with these medications. You know? So it, it seems like a lot of medicine. And I'm very conservative when it comes to medicine. But saying to somebody, now you've got to take a pill three times a day, doesn't sound like I'm very conservative, does it? But really, you do want to be as conservative as possible. So carbidopa, levodopa, as you can see, is two words, carbidopa and levodopa. The levodopa is dopamine. So that's what we're giving back. The carbidopa is in there to keep you from puking. Okay. <laughs> because if you gave levodopa by itself, it would cause it would cause it to up. Um, so that's really blocking that and helping it to um, be taken up into the system better. So there is a the carbidopa levodopa or levodopa is natural. It's made out of fava beans and velvet beans. We don't really eat those beans in the United States. Those are really European beans. Um, can you eat enough of the, those beans and uh, make up for it in your diet? No. Um, plus, there are side effects with lots of beans. <laughs> so, <laughs> you wouldn't want to. <laughs> However, there are, there are formulations of it called a mucona powder that you can find in health food stores or on Amazon. A number of years ago when I was at the Parkinson Center, um, we obviously got patients from many states and things. I had the support group leader from uh, Michigan called me and she said, basically, everybody wants to know, wants to uh, start this mucona powder because it's natural. And so she had people that were going to health food stores and uh, going through Amazon to get this mucona powder. And I said, well, that is carbidopa, levodopa. It's just in a, you don't have to play pharmacist and try to figure out the dose. Plus, it doesn't have carbidopa, so they're all going to puke. <laughs> so, you know, don't, I, I always try to discourage that. Uh, even though they think, well, I'm going to the health food store, so it's natural. <coughs> so is it, it is in the pill as well. Just like as if you were low in calcium, and I'm going to give you that calcium, yeah, it's in a pill form. You know, we know the dose, we know the amount to give you. Same with carbidopa, levodopa, so it is natural. Um, there are a couple other formulations, parcopa. Parcopa is a orally disintegrating formulation of levodopa, so people who do have swallowing problems 
or say they've gone into the hospital, can't take things by mouth, or they're NPO, you know, so they can't take things by mouth, or just not swallowing well, or whatever the deal might be, at risk for aspiration, you can do uh, Parcopa as a as a alternate. Uh, Stilevo is a combination of carbidopa, levodopa, and another medication called enticaprone. And then Ritari. Ritari is the newest formulation of carbidopa, levodopa, and uh, it's the longest acting uh, formulation of carbidopa, levodopa. When I was at the Parkinson's Center, we also had a whole arm of uh, clinical trials. So um, I did all those studies to get those, those drugs approved. There's only one on the market that I, that I didn't do. So my target we did for over four years. I love it. I especially love it for my patients who are what we term young onset Parkinson's. Um, and that's mainly because our whole goal with medications and the reason why we even do clinical trials is to get longer acting uh, effect of the medication so that uh, they don't end up having problems like you see with Michael J. Fox where he fluctuates. Um, you know, he have peaks and troughs. Um, and you may have had uh, people you know or patients that you, or people that you take care of uh, that have those problems with on and off periods where the medications just don't seem to be working well and now they're little functioning declines. So we're trying, to, we're trying to ward that off if possible. Um, that's my complete goal in the clinic is not to treat people right now, but keep them looking good for a long time, especially my young onset people. Right now I have, um, well, my youngest patient was 11. Um, right now I have two brothers. Um, one just graduated high school and one is still in high school. They have a long time to treat them. You know, that side effect profile of those peaks and troughs in the medication is a reality for them. It is a reality for everybody. So I really have to be wise in the medications that I pick. Side question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, any fear point of uh, so your question is um, about CBD oil in Parkinson's. Obviously, it's not something that can prescribe. Um, um, and a lot of research hasn't gone into it as well. So most of the information that I'm giving back is a bit uh, anecdotal based on my patient's experience who's, who have used it. I haven't had anything go bad yet. That's what I can tell you. And I'll be honest, I had one uh, patient in particular who uh, she came in with her husband, a daughter, and a son, and they really wanted mom to try the C try CBD oil. And she's a pretty anxious person and things, but um, I was married because she actually has had uh, dementia and some executive function problems, and I was really worried about uh, any uh, cognitive reaction that she might have to it. They did a low dose, it didn't really help, so they bailed, but it didn't make her worse, at least, and that was my concern. I really didn't recommend it for her, and they used it anyway. So, um, so I haven't had bad luck yet. I have a couple of patients that absolutely love it. I had one day in the, in the clinic where I have one fellow who's been using it properly for a couple of years now, and he, he came in early and was talking to about, it about, about it to everybody in the waiting room, and so the front desk came in and said, just so you know, you're going to have some questions about CBD oil because he just educated everybody here about, about CBD. That's why it's funny. Um, so good question. Um, I just had this is my third talk this week, and my other talks were all on nutrition and complementary medicine you know, for Parkinson's. Um, so uh, I mentioned about the carbidopa, the levodopa. It's dosed about three times a day at least. Okay. Um, there are times that people come in and they've had it a lot longer than they think. Um, especially the people who don't have tremor, they tend to go a lot longer before diagnosis. I had done an educational um, seminar for St. Francis in Fond du Lac for their, all their staff and their physical therapists and things. And I had a physical therapist who then after that had identified that one of her patients she thought had Parkinson's, so she referred her to me. She had come into St. Francis just because um, she came in to live with her husband with Alzheimer's. She wasn't thrilled to be in my office at all. She didn't really know why she was there. And I said, well, your therapist thinks that you might have Parkinson's. And um, she came in in a wheelchair. Um, she definitely had Parkinson's, and I could clearly say she had it for probably at least 10 years. Okay, she had really, really not been diagnosed at all. And she just thought she was getting older. 
And she was so busy tending to her husband that she didn't pay attention to it. You know, so she really kind of put herself to the side. So we left that day. I prescribed, of course. She still wasn't thrilled with me <laughs> at all. Um, uh, over the course of about a month, we had got her to the dose that she needed, which obviously was a bit higher because she really had this longer, so she required more dopamine than what a typical person would be if they were just newly diagnosed or early diagnosis. So uh, treated her, and it would be a huge change in her in that she was in without a device at all. She had no walker, she had no cane, she was in without a device at all. And she said, you know, I really was not thrilled to be in here with you at all. She goes, but now I feel 20 years younger. And I said, it is, it's not always that dramatic, you know, because obviously she had been dealing with it for a long time. But uh, when the diagnosis is right and the treatment is right, it makes a difference. And the goal is to improve that slowness and that stiffness. Especially when we use carbidopa, levodopa, I always tell people that the first thing that's going to clear up is the stiffness. Okay, so when I'm doing my exam, I'm kind of checking their limbs for the amount of rigidity. That tends to be the first thing that clears up before the slowness. So um, I kind of can predict where we're at on the dose and where we kind of need to be based on that exam. So there are other medications, and some of these may or may not be familiar based on your experience um, with people with Parkinson's. Uh, Mirapex, Pramoproxol, and Requip, Lopinerol. Uh, came out in 1997. Those are both dopamine agonists, so they, they mimic dopamine, but they're longer acting. There's also another medication called Nupro, which is a patch. So those, you know, and the patch is very useful too for people who maybe have swallowing problems, <coughs> especially for people who are having problems with their memory. Because I'm telling them to take a pill three times a day or four times a day, and they can't remember to take their pills on time, right? a lot easier to slap a patch on for 24 hours than it is to try to remember all those doses of medication. The problem is, I love the medication. I did the clinical trials for it. I love the medication. It's not covered well. But I can barely prescribe it because it's not covered well in the insurance. Um, but I do love it if I can get it approved or if people can afford it, I guess. Is the patch more recent? Oh, gosh, you take five more years for insurance? That's a good question. I have to see when I try to think when they're up for years. Yeah, I mean, I can't even think of how long ago that was. It before. It's got to be close, but I don't know. It, when it first came out, it was cheaper, believe it or not. I could get it covered easier when it first came out than what I can now. I was doing a talk recently in Michigan, and the rep was there at the time, and I just kind of pointed them out a little bit. And you know, <laughs> but I mean, I would prescribe it a lot more if I, if I could get it reasonable, because I have to be cost conscious right. as well, you know, so I, I can't just do it. But then I do have some people that really have a lot of problems, either with sensitivity or nausea, that I really need to bypass the gut, and the patch really works well for those people. So. Um, and then there's a medication called Apokin that I never use. Um, that medication is an injectable rescue medication uh, for Parkinson's. And even though the rep you know, really wishes that I would use it, it defeats the whole mentality that I have about training, which is not to cause peaks and troughs, right? It's to try to keep a steady blood level of the drug. And when you inject a big bolus, you get a peak in the, you know, in the blood level. It's defeating my, my theory in treatment. Um, and there are times that people are using a combination of medications. When we think of these medicines, they're not all the same. So uh, Mirapex, Requip, and Nupro are all in this class of what's called a dopamine agonist. And it's kind of funny because I did the clinical trials, like I said, for all three of those drugs. And to me, they're very different, even though they're in the same group. And when I came to Fond du Lac, I noticed that everybody was on Requip. And it was almost this mentality of, let's just pick from a hat on um, which one we'll use. And to me, they're very really different because they have qualities that I would or wouldn't use in certain people. For example, if I have a person who is a, a tremor predominant Parkinson's, I'm more apt to use Primaproxol or Mirapex because I know that Mirapex tends to go more for the tremor. You know, so it has little nuances um, about each medication that I like or dislike. Um, also, side effect-wise, they tend to have a lot of the same side effects as carbidopa, levodopa. Our main 
issues with uh, Parkinson's medication can be nausea. The biggest issue I run into is low blood pressure. Uh, and it, it's a lot of people who have had high blood pressure all, all their lives, uh, once you get Parkinson's, it, it tends to lower blood pressure, and then the medications lower blood pressure as well. Then if I have to try to treat the memory too, those medications lower blood pressure. So I really am um, concentrating primarily on, originally before I can even treat that person, on making sure the blood pressure is stable. I do that before I treat the Parkinson's, before I treat the memory, uh, before I really treat anything, because if I don't have that stable, they're gonna fall, they're gonna pass out on me. So I really have to watch that. Um, all of these medications in particular tend to have a higher incidence of swelling in the legs. I also watch any other health issues. So if a person has congestive heart failure, I don't pick these first, uh, well, I don't probably pick them at all, because they'll cause fluid retention. So I'm only watching the other diagnosis as well. They have an indication, well, as we did the clinical trials for um, Neuropex and Requip, uh, they had uh, shown some signs of possibly causing some problems with compulsions, uh, gambling, uh, sexual compulsions, things like that. Uh, and so that's something that we kind of watch for. It's actually very rare, but we do watch for it. Also, they can cause sedation. So in the clinical trials, we did a whole uh, questionnaire. How likely are you to doze off or fall asleep 30 minutes after a meal, let's say, in a stoplight, you know, things like that. Um, if daytime sleepiness, um, which is pretty rare with these two, but if it happens, I bail. You know, I switch to something else. I had one guy call me. He was doing really well on Mirapex. Um, and he called me from Oshkosh and he said, yeah, I just had to pull over when I was driving. And I'm like, oh no, we're not, we're not gonna have you sleepy while you're driving. We're gonna switch you to something else, you know, so, but you don't know until you try, unfortunately. If you're in Canada, you have to prove that there's uh, no sleepiness. So you have to be on it and not be able to drive for a while or they'll pull your license. So we really, they're a little bit more sticklers than what we are, of course. Um, Medications, this is a really important um, topic for this talk in particular because um, there are medications that are a little off the beaten path uh, for, for Parkinson's. Uh, primarily, amantadine, arcane, and cogentin are very helpful with tremors. So if I've got a patient who has a tremor predominant Parkinson's, those are very helpful medications. But one of the major side effects with those medications is it can dry your mouth. And I always tell people, if it can dry your mouth, it can dry your thinking, right? Anything, any medication that can dry your mouth can dry your thinking. So if I have patients that are exhibiting any signs of memory loss, or that's a part of the complaint, I don't even use these in those people because I'm not going to uh, trigger worsening of those symptoms. Uh, or even, even induce hallucinations, um, paranoia, uh, confusion with those medications. They were great for tremor, but, um, but definitely can come at a price. Uh, so I really watch those, uh, med I, watch, I watch any memory issues, and it's something I ask at every visit, and I, I warn people about, I mean, because you have to, right? Um, and so it, if I have a person on, like I had a fellow in yesterday who was actually new to me, and he was being treated for uh, on childhood dystonia, and um, he was on high levels of arcane trihexapenadol. Mm -hmm. And boy, he, he had a memory like you wouldn't believe, and he had been on high doses of that. So for him, I hadn't really worried about it. I still did memory testing with him just to make sure. Um, what we tend to see with Parkinson's and kind of the differentiation between like Alzheimer's disease and things <coughs> is that people have more problems with what we call verbal fluency. So difficulty getting thoughts into words. They're trying to come up with these words, and that's not just a name or two, okay? It's that in general conversation, especially when we're talking about um, getting together for the holidays, you know, we're coming up on the holiday season with like Thanksgiving and Christmas. Those people tend to kind of listen a lot and follow the conversation. Why? Because they can't interject. They can't keep up with the conversation and they can't, they don't have enough time to interject their thoughts because everybody else has already moved on in conversation. So verbal fluency is a, is a, is a red flag for me, and I, I can tell that even in our visits if that's an issue, and then I'll 
we will carry more, more discussion about it. And also, people who have that or have problems with memory and Parkinson's are very cognizant of it. It's something that they're pretty in tune to, so they'll complain about it. It'll get them down, it'll get them depressed, it'll get them frustrated. The tremor might increase more, things like that. So um, unlike some of the other uh, memory issues where people are really a little bit more oblivious to it, um, they're really cognizant of the problem. Um, another uh, medication is called Selectin, that medication. The newest drug on the market is called Zidago. Um, it's another form of Selectin. It's kind of a, another new name, more expensive name uh, for, uh, for Selectin. Um, it can definitely improve tremor in people with benign essential tremor as well as Parkinson's disease. It is what we call an MAOB inhibitor, so that's a form of an antidepressant as well. So those people also tend to notice that their energy improves, their mood, mood improves. Uh, it's a medication that I never give past noon because it can energize them so much that it'll keep them awake during the night and cause some insomnia. Um, I have one woman in particular that I, I treat her and her brother, and um, she's having a lot of problems with fatigue, which no, who doesn't, right? Um, if I had the cure for that, I'd be rich. <laughs> but she had a lot of problems with fatigue. Her tremor really wasn't responding to anything else. We started selectively. The tremor just really died off and worked well. But she came in and she says, I just stained all of the trim in my house. And I thought, oh Lord, what did I do? <laughs> you know, because her energy level was just so much better and things. And her brother had come in another visit, and they were joking about her having her lady cave because she does her quilting, she was counting pennies for her grandson and all of this, but she gardens. I mean, she just, her activity level and her, you know, it wasn't a crazy off-the-wall compulsive one either. It was, um, it was, if you knew her, it was very in tune to the way she always was in life, you know, so she was kind of back at it. There is a pump, an uh, interjugenal pump called Duova. Um, that's basically takes a GI uh, a surgery to have that pump put in. It's not as pretty as what you would see for like diabetes, some small little pack. It's like a fanny pack. So um, I don't do that much just because the whole purpose of um, like the Jawopa is continuous infusion, but yet you turn it off at night and you got to bolus it in the morning. So it's really not all that continuous to me anyway. Um, and it's a surgery and if I can get people leveled out with a surgery, I'm of course going to do that. The other option too is deep brain stimulator. Um, you can have uh, a stimulator put in for tremor, uh, you can have it for dystonias and, and things like that. Um, that's a surgical procedure, very expensive surgical procedure. Um, again, I, medication management first in my book before I recommend anybody for a deep brain stimulator. I do the adjustments, so the surgeon does the surgery. I do the adjustments to the stimulator. I can, I can change the frequency and the amplitude and things like that um, on the stimulators to adjust uh, for, for symptom control. My biggest issue with that is that if they put it in two different areas of the brain, the substantial nigra or the globus pallidus, depending on your symptoms, and um, if they kind of tickle that speech center a little bit too much, um, people have a lot of speech difficulties afterwards. And even if I try to bring that um, electricity up that electrode, because it's a, up, it's like a defibrillator, it's under the skin, but the lead goes up and goes into the midbrain. You know, um, so if they tickle that speech center just a little bit too much, um, then you can't talk. You know, so and as much as I try to adjust it, I can't. The brain doesn't like to get poked in places it's not supposed to get poked. <laughs> So what to expect from Parkinson's treatment? Again, the first thing that I tend to notice is that, that stiffness improves. So people can find that they need to cut them a little bit easier. They can, you know, do those, uh, you know, use a screwdriver. Uh, I had a fellow, I mean, uh, people are still working a lot of times, so they need to be active. We've got to keep them productive. But I always tell my patients, especially my new patients, I say, I don't want Parkinson's to define you. I don't want you to become diabetic. You know, like, you know, you have your own that. I don't want you to become Parkinson's. I like it when people come in to me and they say, people tell me they can't even tell I have it. That's the goal, right? It's trying to get the left side equal to the right side if possible. Um, 
the ability to get up out of a chair. That's one of the things I use. So when I'm, I'm talking to people about what's supposed to happen, we do the exam, and I literally say, keep this exam in mind today. How you said that it was harder to do with your right hand whenever we did the exam, and yet you're right-handed. It should have been easier to do than with the left hand. Um, and how much better that gets. I tell people to give me a percentage of improvement. My goal is 70% or better. How easy is it for you to get out of the chair? Do you need a bunch of pushes to get out of the chair? Or can you cross your arms and stand up from your chair? So those are, I have to be really specific because otherwise people come in. I've had patients who come in and have been treated somewhere else for a number of years. And I say, well, why were you on this medication? And when you started it, what happened? Well, I don't know what's supposed to happen. I really want you to know what's supposed to happen. It should be that we're identifying some things throughout your day that's supposed to happen and improve. That's why exercise is such a great gauge for that. It becomes a control. If you do that regularly throughout the day, and you're going, I can get on the bike, I can get on the treadmill, or I can walk three blocks before my right leg wants to scuff and hit a, you know, a crevice in the sidewalk. Now I can walk seven blocks, or you know, get you have to use those things as a gauge of um, improvement. Obviously, uh, decreased tremor, improvement in swallowing. It's something I think a lot of people don't tend to kind of know that that levodopa. If you have swallowing problems, it's very responsive to levodopa. Okay, so oftentimes I'll have people who that's what I'm using as a gauge for treatment. That's a big issue. I mean, we're talking about aspiration pneumonia here. Um, I take that very seriously, and that's how I'll gauge my dosing. Um, but you got to know that's what you're assessing, and then maybe have staff or speech therapy, somebody to be able to help you give you more information um, on, the, on that symptom. Uh, decreased leg cramps. So people who have uh, a limb that's affected by Parkinson's feel like it's heavy. They feel like it's they're wearing a cement shoe, or it's like it's a tree stump. So these are all descriptions that they give me. Um, but they can also have Charlie horses or leg cramps with a dystonia, and that tells me that the medication um, can be low. It can also tell me if it's too high, So, um, and that's based on timing of the medication. So if it's, um, they're getting a, a dystonia and it's always about an hour after they take the drug, that's telling me that that drug is inducing dystonia as opposed to it being low. It cannot help handwriting, okay? <laughs> People want it to, they cannot help soft speech, and they cannot help drooling. Drooling is the biggest issue because everybody wants me to give them something for their drooling and make that stop, but everything that drives your mouth can drive your thinking. So I'm very selective about who and what, how I treat that. The best thing that I tell people to do is suck on sugar-free hard candy because sugar-free or your dentist is going to send me hate mail. Um, and it triggers that swallow reflex. Um, handwriting uh, improves. Actually, the only study we did that showed improved handwriting is on an exercise program called BIG. So LSBT BIG. And they do a lot of these big movements and it actually improved handwriting. Soft speech responds to LSBT loud. It's a loud therapy program um, that improves voice uh, tone and works with the diaphragm, which is obviously a muscle, to strengthen it to protect the voice more. Side effects, constipation, low blood pressure, edema, anxiety, daytime sleepiness, dyskinesia, which is oh, kind of a, what you see with Michael J. Fox at times, where he's slow or he has a tremor, then they break to uh, let him you know, take his medications, and now the right side has these kind of swing movements or rising movements. That's a dyskinesia. One of my big goals always is to try to make sure everybody knows the difference between a tremor, which is a shake, and a dyskinesia, because they tell me two different things. So especially if you work at a facility or you're a caregiver, and I'm trying to get a report back on how the medication changes work, I don't want dyskinesia. That's telling me the drug is too high, okay? And if you're calling me back and you're saying, oh no, the tremor is worse, I'm thinking they might need more medicine, or really there it's a dyskinesia, and that means it's too much medicine. So that report for me um, is really, really important to be able to identify those symptoms, because um, that's how I'm going to adjust the dose. 
um, blood first spasm. A blood first spasm, especially, is when the eye wants to close. Or these people say, you know, I can see it in the visit, but not everybody identifies as a, as a problem. They just say, well, my eyes just don't want to open, or they'll kind of close their eyes a lot and they'll be clenched. Um, that's a, basically a form of like a dystonia, and that's usually the meds are too high. Okay. Too much bilateral eyes? No, no, not necessarily. It can be just one. Exactly. And that's meds are too high. Mm -hmm. Too high. Mm -hmm. uh, nightmares, nausea, obviously, the hypersexuality, gambling, and a dystonia, which can be um, the arm wanting to pull up. If you're seeing somebody walk and their arm is kind of always wanting to come back here, or kind of wiggle around back here, or pull up or draw up. Um, again, that can be too low or too high, and that's where I'm going to dig around for information on when that occurs. <coughs> Toxicity, confusion, hallucinations, and paranoia. Yes? Lisa, do you ever see increased aggression um, or having issues when the person cares to be done and things like that? And you see that intersectionality to begin with? Um, yeah, but it usually it also tends to be a case. So anytime we're seeing those issues, we also worry about um, future dementia, you know, or current, current or future dementia. It should be a little red flag to us that we really need to watch the dose of the medication, but also be thinking of the medication. And usually if there's more aggression there, that, that's giving us a good clue that, um, the that we need. Started. Yep, the dementia is starting. So let's touch on that a little bit, if you don't mind, and that's uh, where I want to really focus too. When we're talking about memory, one of the things that we really have to differentiate is um, whether or not it's a mood disorder, because if you think about it once, if the mood is bad in somebody, uh, it, you're gonna have loss of memory. You're gonna have just, if you're not putting things, if you're kind of, uh, and things are glossing over, and you're really not putting it to memory, you're not gonna be able to pull it out. I always date myself and say, it's like a card catalog, right? <laughs> we don't use those cards. Um, but if you, you know, if you don't file it properly, you're not going to be able to pull it out to use it. So we really, it's really important, and we, we did this when we had the brain bank too, is everybody had to have um, a full cognitive workup, a full cognitive battery. Why? A, to establish a baseline on mentation. Uh, B, to rule out any depression or anxiety. With anxiety, you're like three steps ahead, right? You're not focusing right now. You're not going to be able to, again, kind of file it properly because you're already way over here. Um, and you're not living in the now. Um, so that short-term memory is going to be more of a problem. So we really need to watch um, that it's not a, me a mood disorder as opposed to a memory disorder. Plus in treatment, you're barking up the wrong tree completely, right? You can waste a lot of time on antidepressants if it's an organic memory problem. So it really is important to identify if it's a mood disorder or a memory disorder, or both. Um, so from my standpoint, memory is a big thing. My practice is a lot different now than it was even three years ago in how I treat and how I identify people um, with memory disorders. And a lot of that is just really looking at the research that's out there. And I'm sure you all have, you know, are keeping up with it as best you can as why you're here today, um, memory research. And with Parkinson's disease, we know that people who have that REM sleep disorder tend to be, that tends to be a more of a precursor to memory problems. In my clinic, I, I take that seriously. If that's an, uh, something that I identify, I now do a bunch of labs. I check homocysteine levels. I check Bs. I, I check vitamin Ds. I, there are a whole bunch of labs that we know are inflammatory markers. And we know that a lot of Alzheimer's and vascular dementias as well as Parkinson's disease are now actually more inflammatory in nature than just uh, problems with neurotransmitters. So I really do a lot of diet teaching, uh, nutrition I should say, not diet, because I really don't like the term diet. It really has to be a lifestyle change. We really push the Mediterranean diet. I check these homocysteine levels. My goal is to try to get those homocysteine levels down. I check, I, I always say to everybody, I, I want somebody to check mine, you know, because what do we fear in life? dementia. We don't want it, right? If we could do something to identify it sooner, and I can do something to try to bring that inflammation down and war off dementia, I should be doing that, not waiting till it happens and then treating it with a colonistase inhibitor. So I, I do treat a little differently now, actually a lot differently now than what I did before, just based on, on research and what we know um, 
could be things that we could be identifying sooner, and lifestyle changes that we can make. Because otherwise, we've always waited till we got something. So we wait till we have a heart attack, and then we go on a cardiac diet, right? Um, anything that's heart healthy is brain healthy. We're trying to increase those amino acids. We're trying to cut down on those um, saturated fats and things. And I used to kind of say, yeah, Mediterranean diet. I don't anymore. I really talk about it in a lot more detail in my clinic. I'm doing a lot more educating with my patients because they need to take it more seriously than that. And I live it myself. I have rheumatoid arthritis, which is also an inflammatory disorder, you know? Uh, about you know, three, three, five years ago, I changed my diet, and I haven't had a flare-up. I haven't been on prednisone for three years, you know, which was very uncommon for me. I would have to have a lot of flare-ups. So it's made a big difference in, um, in that disease process for me. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not worried about rheumatoid. I don't have dementia. I don't have dementia. So I'm going to do everything I can now to try to ward that off. So I do spend a lot of time trying to educate people, especially on nutrition. But say you've got, you have now memory problems. I do treat that as well. I don't take that lightly. I do see a lot of times, and I think I see it more in facilities where it's kind of given up on. These, there are these symptoms. There are these problems with verbal fluency. Um, there are problems with falls, a lot of falls. What we notice in Parkinson's is the fall rate really increases in people with um, executive dysfunction or problem, problems with their memory. Why? They're not making safe decisions, okay? <coughs> Safety, and it takes a lot of work to walk in a room, identify a chair, <coughs> know all those steps for your body to turn around and sit down and not sit on the arm of a chair and do it safely, or make wise decisions on whether or not you should have picked something up off the floor, okay? So if I can do something to improve um, the decision making, um, I can also help because my patients are hopefully pretty ambulatory. That's my goal. I don't want them just to sit down, right? I want to keep them active, um, but I have to keep them safe in, in that activity too. So I do treat. Um, I will use either three, the three cholinesterase inhibitors, which is the Aricept, uh, Exelon, or uh, Razadine. Uh, Namenda is the only one that's actually been studied in Parkinson's disease for Parkinson's dementia. But they all do work. Uh, and the mendicant, I tend to start more with either Aricept or Exelon <coughs> um, and use Namenda as an adjunct if I need it later. It's kind of in my holster. Um, but I definitely do treat. When we're talking about heart, heart, Alzheimer's disease, the goal is just to kind of slow the course, right? Not in Parkinson's. I actually see an improvement in that verbal fluency. Kids will call me and say, I live out of state. And dad now talks on the phone. He never talked on the phone before because he couldn't carry on that long conversation. So we do see an improvement in the falls because of decision making and also in the verbal fluency. So that's something that, and even the patient reports it. So I do definitely treat that and we actually see an improvement in it. Um, obviously, if there's any infection, so if there's a worsening of confusion, we always need to think about what's going on. Is there an infection, a urinary tract infection? Is there um, a respiratory infection? Also, other medications. With Parkinson's disease, I have a whole list of medications um, that are on a contraindicated card that can cause worsening of memory problems. And I give that out to anybody that I identify that has a memory issue. The biggest culprits there are bladder medicines, right? So if you have any kind of urinary incontinence, what are they going to do? They're going to put you on a bladder medicine that dries your bladder, dries your mouth, dries your thinking, right? If it dries your up, it can dry your thinking. So you've um, got to take a look at that and eliminate any of those um, possibilities. Um, I also have to look at Parkinson's medications. Are any of those worsening the problem? Yeah. When you say dries your thinking, what exactly do you mean by that? I'm talking worsening the dementia and will cause um, more, more hallucinations. Um, worsening behaviors, paranoia. Worse memory? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Everything. Yep. 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 <laughs> so the, the, the sticky wicket that I run into is, I run into it frequently, is the choice of moving well or thinking well. And there are the carbidopa, levodopa, and our anti Parkinson's medications can aid increased homocysteine levels, which I told you before, 
is that inflammatory um, lab that I can run. But it increases homocysteine levels, so I have to watch that. But it also can increase confusion for people. So there are times that I'm walking a very fine line, and people are going, well, you know, mom can't move as well. And I'm going, but if I increase the medication, we're going to worsen the confusion. Okay, so we have to make a choice. We have to find a, a happy medium here um, between moving well and thinking well. And that's a tough choice, but thinking always comes first. Thinking always comes first in my book. Um, because if you're not making good decisions and you don't have those relationships with your family and everybody coming in, it's, it's a big loss. A big loss. Um, I'm not going to probably go into real great detail on this. The one I really kind of wanted to hit on is, like I said, that round sleep disorder. If that's something that, that people are ex experiencing, and there's a little bit of question on whether or not even childhood, like uh, uh, sleepwalking and things like that, are, are, are a precursor to it as well, but there's some research going on there. Um, as far as treating some of those behaviors, I wanted to kind of hit on that. So you probably have seen that commercial on TV for uh, the cat, the black cat, and people with Parkinson's having hallucinations. That's actually a commercial for Nuplazid. Um, that's a medication. I did the study for that too. It was called Pimavanserin at that time um, for people who are experiencing either uh, delusions, uh, paranoid ideation, or uh, hallucinations in Parkinson's. And like I said, that's not everybody, okay? Not at all. But um, it is a once a day medication now. Uh, they came out with a 34 milligram pill. It was 17 milligrams in the study, and we did it two doses in the morning. Um, and that medication can help with, uh, with problems with hallucinations and paranoid ideation. The nice thing that I noticed when we did that study was it didn't drop blood pressure. So prior to that, we were using a medication called quetiapine or Seroquel, which definitely dropped people's blood pressure. Um, which I was always trying to stabilize. Um, and so I was kind of curious whenever the data came out and we got everybody's data pulled together, if that's what everybody else had seen as well, and it's really cool, it's true. So I really like the plaza better in the sense that um, it doesn't drop blood pressure, uh, but yet can treat uh, the hallucinations and delusions. Now the key here is that medication really needs, it really will not kick in for like about three months. So it's not like it's gonna happen overnight. So people will at times call and they'll be on it for a week or two or even for a month and they're going, the staff is going, it's not working. And I go, this is one you've got to give more time. You've got to think of it as a three-month marker before you're really going to notice a big difference. And that's hard. That's a long wait. And that's a lot of frustration for staff members as well or people who are trying to care for those people. How am I doing on time? Okay? Five minutes. All right. <laughs> um, so one of the, uh, like I said, so one of the things to take into consideration too, and I really take seriously, is sleep. Uh, if they're not sleeping well, uh, there is A, we all have a little bit more anxiety. If you didn't get a good night's sleep, no, it's not the greatest the next day. Um, but also, for my patients, they're at greater risk for falls. We're also not as kind of with it cognitively um, when you haven't had a good night's sleep. So it is really important to take that sleep into consideration. Um, with Parkinson's, if it is a Parkinson's dementia, you will still see sundowning. It will get worse at night. Some of that can be that the medication might be building up in the system by bedtime. So a lot of times I take into consideration if there's any involuntary movements or if um, it seems like the medication is building up towards the evening and I might just decrease that so that that, um, that helps. That's usually my first goal is to decrease medications. Um, if I can, without inhibiting too much movement, um, prior to adding more medicine. I mean, the last thing we want to do is keep adding more medicine. You guys have had, uh, obviously, great speakers talking about environmental changes that you can make. That always comes first. It's something I'm always trying to encourage facilities to do or people in their homes is to put on familiar music and things like that to try to really reorient people um, prior to uh, medications. Same with sleep. If there are environmental changes that we can make, we all have probably raised children, right? If, if they don't sleep well at night, they're gonna try to sleep during the day and things that there's too much sleepiness during the day, you're not gonna sleep at night. So activity during the day makes a difference. Even using essential oils, 
things like that to try to get people to calm down a little bit more and use that sense of smell uh, to uh, lead into downtime towards bedtime um, can help before just meditating everybody, especially if it's, uh, there's more dementia we need to watch um, how many medications we're adding. It's more to take them away than, than to keep adding more. Uh, what to report, I kind of talked about it. Low blood pressure, right? Or dizziness when standing. Um, dyskinesia, which is a writhing movement or a wiggling movement, or the arm might want to pull back or pull up. Um, that's not a tremor. A tremor is like this, okay? Um, and even tremor, just realize we don't always knock it out. But we obviously want people to be independent with feeding and things like that, but we don't always knock it out. That's a little bit unrealistic. Um, this happens, but I chalk that up to luck. Um, hallucinations are not normal, even if it's a neat little kitty that's kind of keeping somebody warm. It's not normal to have hallucinations, and we need to know about it. Okay. Um, paranoid or delusional thinking. I ask these questions all the time in my clinic, and it's, it's not uncommon that a person's even coming in from a facility and the daughter's with, and I'll say, um, any hallucinations, see any people or animals that really you know don't live there. And they'll say, oh yeah, I have this dog that comes to visit. And the daughter's like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, they haven't, they've never heard that before because people keep that in, especially our patients because they're aware of it and they feel like they're losing it. They don't have to just readily report that. So it's something that you have to ask about. Um, did the dreams or nightmares? Again, to me, that's a little bit of a red flag, so I want to know about that. Um, just more information on it. When does it happen? What time of the day does it, uh, do these symptoms occur? Is the confusion more at night time? Is it after a dose of certain medications? <coughs> Things like that. So, um, I'll kind of leave you with that. How's that sound? Um, obviously, if it's a new issue, we want to know about it as soon as possible. Don't wait a month, okay? Because it makes it a lot easier to catch and, and um, follow up on it. Most of the people with Parkinson's who have any memory issues, it's not an auditory hallucination, it's visual. They usually don't have a face. Um, they're friendly, they kind of stand in the way, or it's an animal. Um, but they don't usually talk, and they don't usually have a face. I don't know why that is, but that's that. I'm going to skip over this because we don't have enough time. <laughs> so, thank you very much for having me.